Hey guys, Mr. Klein here. Uh, chapter 10, Lesson 1, we're starting a brand new unit on uh, Earth's past. We're going to go all the way from the creation of the solar system and planet Earth, the forces that took care of that, all the way to our modern time. So we're going to, you know, go like several billion years in about four weeks. But our first lesson is on Chapter 10, Lesson 1, on fossils. Yes, fossils, dinosaurs, you know. Yes, we have to use the movie voice, dinosaurs, because dinosaurs are big, massive creatures that's captured our imagination for years upon years upon years. Uh, and what you see right here is actually Sue, the most complete reconstruction, I mean, I'm sorry, the most complete skeleton of a Tyrannosaurus Rex that we found. It was found in South Dakota in about 1990 uh, and is now at the Field Museum in Chicago. If you ever get up there, it is something to see. Uh, by the end of this lesson, you will be able to answer the following questions. Question number one says, what is a fossil? And question number two is, what can fossils reveal about Earth's past? So let's get started with our notes. Uh, see, the first thing is, uh, branching off our unit talking about the Earth's surface and forces that form it, is that we see that rocks provide clues to Earth's past. Sedimentary rocks, remember, are sediment laid over, compacted, and cemented over time. And because they get laid one on top of the other, they get to give us a good clue as to what life was like once upon a time you know, even hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, even billions of years ago, because generally, uh, deposition goes one on top of the other. Now, some of the most obvious clues that are present in rocks are what we call fossils. This is really important. Fossils, the preserved remains are evidence of ancient living organisms. Okay, so fossils, the preserved remains are evidence of ancient living organisms. That's not to say that fossils aren't being made now. Uh, some creatures are being, uh, that whenever they die, we talk about how fossils are created. Uh, the processes that form fossils still take place today. But what we're finding right now are formerly living things tens of thousands all the way back to millions of years ago. Now, some of our scientists thought that fossils formed from the remains of organisms killed in disasters, volcanic eruptions, giant floods, things of that nature, uh, and they thought that that was the only way that fossils form. And the belief that came out of that was what we call catastrophism, for after catastrophe. Okay, remember catastrophe, something really bad happens. Okay, so catastrophism is the idea that conditions and creatures on Earth change because of quick and violent events. And when we talk about quick, we talk about quick geologically. We're not talking about one day, life is going fine, and then the next day, bam, you know, giant flood, zillions of feet of water burying and drowning everything and changing mountains and everything like that, or volcanic eruption, kaboom, and Earth is changed forever. You know, and we're not even talking about that. We're talking quick geologically. We might talk about months or even years with that. So, Based on his observations, uh, there was a farmer and a scientist uh, from Scotland in the 1700s. His name was James Hutton. He said that he looked at the terrain in which his farm was based on. He noticed that deposition, erosion, things like that didn't take place quickly, rather took place slowly. So he said rather than bang, you know, things happening all of a sudden, he said that changes took place very slowly. And he developed the principle that geologists use, and it's what we call uniformitarianism. Yeah, really big, long word, uniformitarianism. And according to the principle of uniformitarianism, the same geologic processes, erosion, deposition, sedimentation, compaction, all the stuff that happened in a rock cycle, all these processes, not only that, but later on plate tectonics gets uh, and continental drift gets thrown into this, that these processes occur today also occurred in the past. And this principle says that the change on Earth, they go in slow, continuous cycles. Uh, in addition to the changes in uniformitarianism, occasionally, though, we will have catastrophic events that take place. For example, the event whenever we get into geologic time, the event that killed off the dinosaurs and killed the Mesozoic era was because of a probably, mm, scientists believe, the main theory, is that a, probably a giant asteroid or hit planet Earth around 65 million years ago, actually not too far from us down in Mexico. So most of the time, you'll have changes because of cycles, but occasionally a spanner gets thrown into the works and things go nuts and things happen from there. But essentially, uniformitarianism is like the f 
the cycle, the cycles and the process that we see now and the speeds at which they take place normally would have always taken place like that in the past. And this is one of the things that underpins modern geology. Now, let's talk about fossils. Remember, uh, fossils are the preserved remains of evidence of ancient living organisms. And here's the thing. An organism is more likely to become a fossil if it contains hard parts such as teeth or bones. It's not exactly as though scientists will go out on a dig and will pull up the fossilized remains of an apple. Okay, uh, We won't see that because it's not very hard. It's soft. It's more likely to decompose quickly. And the thing is, fossils are more likely to form if the organism is buried relatively quickly after it dies. Now, it could get buried in a mudslide, it could get buried in a flood, a volcanic eruption, something like that, or it can just die and sink to the bottom of a lake or a pond and something like that, and uh, remains can go on top of it and preserve it. Now, most fossils that oftentimes we can see are relatively small bone fragments. Occasionally we'll find something like Sue, or we'll find something like at the picture at the bottom of this page, uh, and ones that we'll get on later. Uh, very rarely will we see entire skeletons. We'll oftentimes find bits and pieces. But even within rocks, we'll find tiny fossils, and these fossils are called, well, microfossils. Eh, it kind of makes sense to me. Micro meaning small or tiny. So, let's talk about fossils. Now, if the actual organism becomes a fossil, Generally, like I said, it was enclosed by soil or ice or whatever over a long period of time. As a result, it keeps it away from air and bacteria, the decomposers. If you remember, last year in life science, we talked about decomposers and things like the carbon cycle like that, that what happens is these decomposers will break down living matter and put it back into the soil to use for living things to go. Occasionally, living things will get out of the carbon cycle and they'll get fossilized. Now, some fossils are what we call carbon film. Okay, We're going to go over several types, but essentially carbon film forms when pressure drives off the gases and liquids from an organism's tissues, leaving only the carbon behind. So what kind of happens is, for example, I'm about to show you, a fish got caught in some rock, Okay, maybe there was a flood, maybe, you know, it died, settled down the bottom, soil game on top of it. And what happened is, as the cementation, the compaction, and the uh, cementation took place, all that pressure and the heat which the sedimentary rock formed squeezed out all of the water, all of the gases that make up the, made up the organism's tissues, and all that was left was the carbon, and the carbon was imprinted. So it's kind of almost like metamorphic rock, how you have one type of rock, heat and pressure applied, and it bends and changes into something else. Okay, so let's look at some types of fossils. Here's two of them. First off, preserved remains. Uh, the most recent fossils we'll find are preserved remains. This woolly mammoth was found in Russia. It dates back to about 10,000 years. It was preserved in ice, and it was actually butchered by humans. Okay, they are actually show marks of humans using knives and cuttings in order to cut it and butcher it to take meat. And this was the carcass. This was kind of what was left. It was thrown out in the ice. It got buried by more ice, and it was preserved. And scientists in Russia were able to pull it out. Here's an example of carbon film. Okay, the ancient fish's remains uh, were purged of all liquids and gases due to the heat and pressure during the process of compaction. Okay, so that's two types of fossils. Another type is fossils also will form when minerals and groundwater replace the tissues of dead organisms. Some fossils also are molds. Mold and cast fossils are oftentimes what we'll see. They're impressions of rocks left by ancient organisms. And this is how these form. A mold, it's kind of like a jello mold, okay? So you go, you go to make jello and you're gonna make like, you know, the, the Christmas tree, or you're gonna make it like Christmas time. So you get the mold and you pour in the jello, you throw it in the fridge and it hardens up or gelatinizes. And the gelatin, you shake it out, it falls out. Oh look, there's like our little Christmas tree jello. Well the jello, that jello would be a cast. Okay, so when the mold fills with the sediment or mineral deposits, it forms a cast. And then in addition, we have trace fossils, which show evidence of the activity of ancient organisms such as tracks or nests. If you ever go in between Austin and San Antonio, Texas, there's a state park that has dinosaur tracks where you can go out there. So essentially, dinosaurs walked in the mud, okay, and that mud dried and was suddenly covered by another layer of mud. And what ended up happening was over time, it all solidified into rock, and the rock above the tracks uh, was eroded away, and all that was left were 
the footprints. And so you can actually go up and you walk, and you can walk in the footprints of dinosaurs. Okay, so let's look at these other two types, the mineral replacement. Uh, in Arizona, there's a uh, national park... Uh, National Preserve calls the Petrified Forest. And essentially, at one time, which we'll get into, the climate of Arizona out west was really different. And they had nice big forests. And so over time, trees died and they fell. And this example of a petrified tree trunk, what happened was it got buried in water, okay? And minerals such as gypsum and halite salt or other minerals that make up rocks got in between the cell walls of the individual plant cells. Okay, remember plant cells have hard cell walls uh, that uh, animal cells don't have. And so what happened is once the minerals got there, okay, they hardened up, probably through evaporation or something like that, and the cell walls eventually died off and they were decomposed and they went away. And all that was left was the minerals forming the tree trunk. So that's actually a rock that essentially at one time was the inner workings of a tree. And then here's the example of a trilobite, which is an ancient organism, uh, kind of like a crustacean, uh, with a mold in the cast. If you see it right here, here's the mold. Okay, So this is one type of rock right here. And right here is the cast, which is the other type of rock, uh, which filled in the mold and it was dried out also. Okay, so well, who exactly are the people who study these? Well, paleontologists are scientists who study fossils. Once upon a time, when I was like five, I wanted to become a paleontologist. I read books on dinosaurs, and I thought dinosaurs were the neatest thing ever. It was like, dinosaurs, rah! And I had like all these books on dinosaurs, and I would read everything. I could tell about Triceratops, uh, Protoceratops, all these things, the Permian era, you know, Triassic, Jurassic, uh, Cretaceous, all these stuff that we'll talk about, and I wanted to become a I wanted to become a scientist who studied dinosaurs, and I ended up finding out paleontologists are scientists who study fossils. Little would I know that almost 30 years later, I'm teaching kids about paleontology. Anyway, paleontologists are kind of like a mixture of two types of scientists. Paleontologists are geologists because they have to know about rocks because that's where fossils are found, but they're also biologists because they study how these fossils and how they interact in the world they lived in while they were alive. So what, did, what they do is paleontologists will compare fossils of ancient organisms with organisms that live today. And because of uniformitarianism, hey, you know, if uh, there's a hot, moist climate, chances are these formerly living organisms act like the ones who live in a hot, moist climate today. So, like I just said, paleontologists use uniformitarianism to learn about the environments of ancient organisms. Now, and like I just said, also, if a fossil of an ancient organism is similar to an organism that lives today, these two organisms might have lived in a similar environment, okay? Because of uniformitarianism, climates that we see today probably worked and acted, the biomes and the individual ecosystems probably work the same just with different organisms than they do now, okay? So... Let's talk about these. Now, fossils will show that Earth's climate has changed many times in its past. Uh, one time, I think six, eight hundred million years ago, something like that, they called Earth was a giant snowball because it was really cold. Uh, the Permian period, which I'll show you on a map, part of Texas was a giant ocean. Uh, Louisiana only didn't exist, where we're at in Louisiana didn't exist until 10,000 years ago. You know, things like that. Uh, and the temperature was really different. I mean, if you watch The Land Before Time or you watch Ice Age, any of those are kind of cartoon versions of climate change and things that happened in the past. So fossils of plants such as ferns indicate that the Earth was warm and humid about 200 million years ago. Uh, remember, ferns are vascular, non-seed-bearing plants, and they generally grow in warm areas all over the tropics. They don't grow in Antarctica. However, we found fossils of ferns. Remember Glossotera, when we were talking about continental drift, that's what Alfred Wegener used uh, as evidence. Uh, so these ferns lived in areas that, were, that are really warm now, so we assume that they lived in areas that were really warm back then. So around 200 million years ago, Earth was a lot warmer than it was now. Uh, on the other hand, until about 10,000 years ago, there was an era where the Earth was really cold as compared to now, and glaciers covered large portions of the United States and almost all of Canada, which I'll show you guys in a minute. And so, like I said, fossils of organisms like the woolly mammoth, that's what you saw in that picture earlier that was preserved in ice, helped scientists learn about times when the Earth was much cooler. And so we're going to start wrapping this up. You can look at this. See, the Permian Basin, which is out in West Texas, 
is right here and where my mouse is at and where I'm clicking essentially that's now high mountains uh, kind of a high plain and there's mountains and stuff but about 255 million years ago uh, that was actually a shallow ocean as compared to now okay so as a result they have lots of fossils there there was ocean life that obviously wouldn't be there now so and based on what we've seen on the fossils that ocean life in the Permian Basin is a lot like ocean life now in shallow oceans and on the other hand how earth was cool is right here all this stuff and uh, dark blue is uh, during the Pleistocene era, which only ended about 10,000 years ago. These were glaciers, okay? Huge moving sheets of ice. Okay, notice right here where my mouse is at. That's Chicago, okay? So glaciers went as far south, almost as far south, almost to St. Louis. Okay, so it came relatively close to Louisiana. But remember where we're at in St. Mary Parish, that was only starting just to be filled in about 10,000 years ago. So it was really a swampy, marshy area, kind of like towards Sippermore Point and stuff like that, where there isn't a lot of land there as opposed to now where it's nice and firm. Now, on the other hand, when you look here in Europe, about at the same time where glaciers retreated, came as about as far south as St. Louis, most of northern Europe was covered in a giant ice sheet. In fact, in this area of Sweden, Finland, and Norway, the ice sheet was about five, 600 feet thick in spots, okay? But over time, the climate changed. Earth got warmer over time, and the glaciers retreated to where they are now, where you see, you know, in northern, northern climates in Montana over here, in Alaska, British Columbia, and then the big Greenland ice sheet. So we're going to go into this in more detail as the uh, unit goes along, but this is just kind of setting the stage that how we're able to find out about that information is based on fossils. So let's go ahead and let's answer our questions and wrap this up. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to answer the following questions. Question number one, what is a fossil? Well, a fossil is the preserved remains or evidence of ancient living organisms. Okay, there could be several types. Uh, they can be carbon film. They can be uh, preserved remains. They can be cast in mold. They can be petrified through mineral replacement. Or they can even be uh, trace fossils of dinosaur tracks or shells or things like that. And what can fossils reveal about the Earth's past? Well, Fossils mainly can tell us about the types of organisms that lived on Earth millions of years ago. But not only that, when we use the concept of uniformitarianism, which is that processes we see on Earth now happened at the same rate and stuff millions of years ago, they give us clues as to what the environments and what Earth's climate and things like that were like back then also. So that's your lesson, Chapter 10, Lesson 1, Fossils. Always have any questions, feel free to let me know. Thanks for watching.